Howdy once again, it's Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back. In this short video, I'm going to talk about lathe mandrels, what they are, and how you can use them. And this is all in preparation for a video coming up pretty soon in the series. This will be a three part series, really. Uh, first one about mandrels, and then I will cast up some little wheels out of aluminum and hold this on a mandrel while I uh, machine it. And the purpose of this, this is a little wheel for a sander, a belt sander, band sander, but the purpose is to show you in the third video how to put a crown or a double taper on a wheel. So that's what I'm working up to with this initial video on lathe mandrels. This is my selection of lathe mandrels. Some of you might call them an arbor, but more correctly uh, uh, pronounced or, or named uh, a mandrel. And they are available, I'll show you the catalog here in a minute, uh, and they're fairly reasonable. Ten or twelve dollars for one in say the 5.8 size. They are hardened steel with a flat spot on each end and a very accurate uh, center hole. Uh, did I say they're hardened? And they are tapered. So the 5 8 for instance, is tapered. This is the large end, which has a plus on it. This is the small end, of course, with the minus. Some will only be marked with the size, and they stamp the size on the large end. So remember, there's a large and a small. There's very little taper, and I'm going to measure that in a minute and show that to you. And a mandrel is pressed on to the work with an arbor press. So sometimes we call it an arbor. Notice that it just barely starts on this pulley and then it would be pressed hopefully so it ends up about in the middle so that this can be held with a dog between the centers in the lathe and the operations turning, grooving, tapering, whatever it is can be performed on the lathe and often uh, flipped over and you work from the other end, so you can do it either way. So that's what a lathe mandrel is. Now some of these mandrels are factory made, obviously. Here's a couple that are still in their original packaging. You know, this is, these are old enough to where they're made in Pennsylvania, so those have been in the package. They're, seven, they're odd sizes that I never have needed, so I never have taken them out. But typically they're going to look like this when you buy a, a new one probably sold in a tube like this. And there, again, there's a three-quarter with a plus. And notice it's not marked on this end. You're going to see a variation on this. But my point here is that years ago in uh, schools, often one of the student projects was to make a mandrel. And you'll find uh, blueprints for these in some of the old project books. Uh, that's a commercially made one there, but you can see, well some of these are, but if they're uh, made like this, you can see that's that's homemade, and is it even stamped? But it's a difficult project for students because they need to be ground, not just turned, and that's just a very uh, small taper on there, so it's just not something that, that's easy for kids to and I don't suggest making your own. I suggest buying them. And here they are in the catalog. Here's the KBC catalog, but you're going to find, probably find these in, in most uh, shop catalogs. But on this page, happens to be 371 in this edition, here are precision lathe mandrels. The description here is, again, they're hardened and ground, and they're designed for setting up accurately board or rim blanks and castings between centers. Note here that the standard taper is about a half of a thousandth per one inch of length. So for sizes under one inch, which all of mine are, there's, again, a half a thousandth undersize on smaller end, and then uh, the larger sizes, if you go over one inch, are 1,000 undersize on the smaller end. And I, again, I'm going to measure them here in just a second and show you that. Just to show you that they're not really worth making, here's a half inch size, which would be a popular one. Notice that it's five inches long. They're all in the uh, five and six and seven inch range here in the common sizes. And uh, a five-eighths like I'll be using is a 
eleven dollars and the three quarter which I had in that tube is twelve bucks so it's really very reasonable buy yourself a selection of them I mentioned that many of the machine shop books had uh, mandrels as projects so there is one in here let's take a look at it notice that on the blueprint here for the mandrel they give you a somewhat generic drawing here that covers many different sizes and then you refer to the chart here for instance if it was to be a half inch one they tell you what the length is and uh, the lengths of the ends and then the diameter and here it says taper per foot should be about six thousandths and turn twenty five thousandths oversize harden and grind to size mandrels half a thousandth below standard at the small end now uh, when we were in high school when I was a high school student we did this as a project but we had a large cylindrical grinder I believe it was a Landis and it was already set up by the teacher for the right taper per foot so we turned it and then everybody just put their their arbor into the uh, grinder their mandrel into the grinder and ground it at that preset angle which could be very accurately set on a cylindrical grinder compared to a lathe this is the digital micrometer I recently got from Banggood. I showed that in one of the videos, but you know it's just perfect for this type of demonstration because the uh, numbers are so large. It really shows up well, doesn't it? But typically here, this is the five eighths. I just want to show you the sizes that in the center here, where you might actually have place your work. You can see that it's. Uh, well, there's uh, 625 and a half, so that's a half thousandth over 5 eighths right there. But on the small end, that's the minus end. Too much detail for you? Speed it up. You can see that it's a half thousandth under 5 eighths on that end. And then on the large end, the positive end, it is. Uh, well, about a half thousandth over five eighths. Now, similarly, let's look at the three quarter. This is a brand new one. Now, on the large end of the three quarter, it's uh, well, call it seven fifty two. So it's two thousandths over on that end, and on the small end. Well, not much under is it half thousandth under and let's see about in the middle here where you would place the work it's uh, four tenths of a thousandth over so you get an idea that they are tapered and they need to be pressed on with the arbor press but the point that I have to make today is that the work that you're preparing the blank needs to be very accurately reamed or bored or your mandrel is going to fall right through it and you're going to be very disappointed so you need to take the time when you prepare the blank to probably drill it then bore it and then ream it or if you don't have the reamer just bore it but get it accurate or it's going to fall through and you're going to uh, have to start over or hold the work in another manner so for instance if this was a gear blank and the teeth hadn't been cut yet we would want to mount it on an arbor and you've seen me do that in a gear videos I believe but and you might put some oil on here there it starts on and then we would put it in the arbor press and I'm gonna press this on it to show you and push it from this end hopefully so that it would end up about in the middle but it might go a little bit past or maybe not to the middle but do not if it's a casting force it on and crack it now if you do not have an arbor press you can put it in the vise and I know it, it seems kind of crude but you could tap it with a lead hammer and it's probably going to work all right but uh, you know don't do this all right here's the Dake arbor press and we'll just put the work in there like that
press it down until it's approximately in the middle. And conversely, when the job is completed, we now have the minus end on the top and we'll just press it out. I'd like to point out that sometimes the work will not end up in the exact center, but that's okay. And of course, as I told you before, you hold uh, one end in the dog, with the dog, and then the dog can be flipped around on the other end, on the flat spot, of course, for your set screw. But an alternate way is to hold one end, probably the, uh, the ground end here, in a collet because that would be quite accurate, but I wouldn't hold it in a three-jaw chuck unless you have a very accurate three-jaw chuck and uh, the work isn't that critical. But remember that a three-jaw chuck will not grip very well on uh, this hardened, slick, and slightly tapered uh, surface. Now, in the school shop, and probably in every shop for that matter, in uh, facing down the work to length or whatever, the students, the worker often cuts into the mandrel. Now this is a homemade mandrel, so perhaps it was soft enough to where we could cut into it. But either you're going to damage the mandrel or dull the tool if you hit the hardened mandrel. So uh, consider that. This is not a mandrel here, this is just a piece of cold roll steel, but you can imagine in the high school how many kids reamed oversize or, or they drilled it uh, to oversize and then attempted to ream it. And, you know, things didn't work out. You didn't want them to always have to start over because there may not have been time for that. So an alternate way that we sometimes did it was to make our own soft mandrels. So just by taking a piece of cold roll steel and facing both ends and very, very accurately, if you can, uh, center drilling them, the work could be held on with the set screw because often there was going to be uh, set screws in the, the work anyway and in some cases then of course the work would spin and it would gall and you couldn't get the arbor out of there, the shaft out of there so I recommend a flat spot for the set screw to ride on otherwise it'll, it'll be galled up and you'll have to drive it out and you ruin both the arbor and the work. So that's one alternative to using this uh, commercially made arbor. Let me show you another way. Now let me illustrate if I can uh, with a little lesson here. And I think you understand that the larger in diameter that the work is, the more likely it is to slip on the mandrel. So th there isn't so much of a chance of this as you're turning it for it to slip. Because in fact you don't have much leverage. You got the leverage here of this little adjustable wrench. However, on larger work such as this, we have the leverage of a much larger wrench as we get out near the, uh, the outside here. So at the high school we made 10 inch uh, disc sanders with a disc something like this only it was out of aluminum and invariably the kids would uh, uh, as they got out near the head uh, would let the work slip as they took too deep a cut and then it would gouge the mandrel. Usually we held it on with a set screw on a homemade mandrel because this type of mandrel was definitely going to slip with a 10 inch disc. I'm getting a little carried away here to, uh, telling you more than you need to know because we were just talking about mandrels for crying out loud but when a large work piece slipped on the mandrel and just visualize this a uh, stub here, that shaft is an actual mandrel. I would double dog it, that is put a dog around the hub of the work if it, if it had one and then since that tail will not reach the, uh, the um, face plate, so which side do I have to be on, then tighten that on there and then one dog goes up against the other. I call it double dogging. Just food for thought if you get into a pinch like that. All right, here's the alternate way. These are expanding mandrels. These are quite expensive, available again. I'll show you the catalog in a second here. In different sizes, and notice that there's two pieces. This piece, again, is hardened and ground with accurate center holes in each end and marked. Maybe it's not marked. 
but they have a greater range. You want to have a little oil on them, but I don't believe this part, well maybe it's hardened, I guess it's hardened, but can you see that it's expanding as I push it on? So, for instance, if you wanted to hold something like this, now I would press it in from this end and it would expand enough to where it could be uh, uh, turn between the center. There is no flat spot on this end, only on this end, so this would have to be the end that was driven by the dog. These are very useful. They have uh, a little bit greater range than uh, if this is a half inch, for instance, it's going to work a little bit above and below, and I'll show you that in the, in the catalog, but they're quite expensive, so it isn't something you can afford to have in stock in your home shop just for the heck of it. Here they are again in the KBC catalog, hardened and ground for speedy setups. Sizes one inch come with one sleeve, larger sizes come with one large and one small sleeve. Let's take a look at the prices. They'll be much higher than the other ones. Alright, take a look at the top one here, which has the range of one half to nine sixteenths. It's five inches long, and that's the one that I have right here. And notice that it's forty-four dollars. And the slightly larger one that I have here has a, a range of uh, between nine sixteenths and twenty-one thirty seconds, and it's a little bit more, forty-six dollars. Now you've seen a bomb. Adam Booth used these, I believe. And look at how expensive they are in the larger size, but these are particularly, they're delicate. They are delicate. You can easily damage them or ruin them. So I would say that uh, they're more often used with grinding, on grinding machines, than they are probably on the lathe. Uh, but that's just my, my reading on it. So there you have it. Regular lathe mandrels and the expanding mandrels. What's your choice? Okay, I hope that gives you a pretty thorough understanding of lathe mandrels, of what they are, how they can be used, and be sure and watch the following two videos. In uh, the next one, I'm going to cast the blanks out of aluminum for these wheels, and then in the following one, and I do not know what the numbers are for those videos yet, because they haven't been shot, but uh, in the following one, I will mount this on a mandrel and uh, put a crown on it so that the belt will ride on it. You know what a crown is, I think. I'll explain it then. So, hope you enjoyed this uh, rather short video for me, and uh, join me in my others. This is Tubal Cain saying, so long for now.